What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the dungeon. Welcome back to the channel. I am Nicholas. That is Noah at FB God on the Twitter. Make sure you're following us on that platform as well as all the other social medias, which will be linked down below. We're talking trade targets. The trade deadline is creeping up on most fantasy football leagues. I know for Yahoo, the default trade deadline is this upcoming Saturday, I think. So make sure you go check your league settings uh, when you're on the league page to, you know, to make sure that you aren't past the trade deadline already or just to give you a heads up on, on when that is coming up so you can make any moves necessary. Now, for those of y'all that are not on Yahoo or have customizable, let me know what settings you guys have. Like, are you like two weeks out from your trade deadline? Is Sleeper, uh, I'm not sure what Sleeper's default trade deadline is or ESPN or anything like that. So uh, if you are playing on leagues outside of Yahoo, just drop us a comment down below because we are trying to figure out different content for going forward. What I think we're going to do is after this week, depending on if there's still a lot of people that have their trade deadline going, we're going to look at streaming options. So tight ends, defenses, and quarterbacks, and like the best combination of those type of streaming options, like two quarterbacks that over the next five weeks will give you a uh, high-end quarterback one matchup or something like that. So we'll pivot over to that content, but drop us uh, a little little ting down below on your trade deadline as well as what kind of content y'all want to see from us moving forward. Noah, how we doing? We're doing pretty well. Trade deadline's approaching. I'm trying to get all my deals out there. You know, when you have these big fans, yeah, I'm trying to finesse. I mean, I make these charts and I look at them and I analyze and I'm just trying to finesse behind the scenes before this video comes out on Wednesday, even though nobody I know watches these videos. So when you, uh, when you like propose a trade to someone in other leagues, do you, do you make like a specialized chart? Like one of the charts that you would put in this video, do you send it to him? Like, dude, look at the schedule. Upcoming. You <laughs> no, I'll just text him. I'll be like, man, you don't want Mark Andrews. He's awesome. That's about it. And that's about as much analysis as they need. Okay. See, that's the problem right there. Trading. Trading is, is as much of an, this is a reason why I don't think anyone should veto trades because trading is not just a, it's not just an equation. It's not just like this guy is better than this guy. There's a lot of art to it, right? There's the finesse, there's the neg negotiations. Noah's obviously still a beginner on this stage. He dropped a lot of big facts for you, but apparently he doesn't use that behind the scenes. So that I don't remember what the point was, but don't veto trades because there is an art to the trading. The negotiations are huge. Wait, no, I actually have another question that I've never asked you before. You said no one that you know watches these. Do people know that like you do this? Some people. Like Some my people, friends do. Your friends know you do that? Like, does your family know that you have like 3,000 followers on Twitter <laughs> because of fantasy football? No, because I only have 2,700. No, but like... <laughs> Fucking fire. Now you have zero again. I mean, my parents don't have a Twitter, but like my brother does but he doesn't respect me enough to really care. I, I respect that. I don't, I don't think like <laughs> anyone really respects me enough still either way. So uh, we're still trying to make it big. We still want our families to care about us. We're not at that level. But what would help us get to that level is if you hit the thumbs up button on this video. If you subscribe to the channel, if you're new, Noah, hit that intro. All right, the first guy we're going to buy low on, and he's not really being bought low because not many people are going to really sell him, but it's Nick Chubb. And if somebody is selling him, it's mostly because he's coming off with two pretty poor performances. Two weeks ago against the Patriots, he had a pretty good game on the ground, but it didn't really translate into fantasy points because one, he fumbled twice, and two, he didn't find the end zone. Last week, again, he had a pretty poor performance, but you could chalk that up to them playing Denver, who Pro, Pro Football Focus has as the number one ranked run defense. So if there's ever time to buy low on Nick Chubb, it's because of that. Because people may think that this offense is so bad that he won't be able to produce. And they might look to these past two weeks uh, as evidence for that. But they played two pretty strong defenses. And I would assume that to, like, that's going to bounce back, especially with his upcoming schedule, which we'll touch on later. Another reason why you could probably buy low on him is with Kareem Hunt now returning this week. People might think that Kareem Hunt's just going to take this job or at least get like a 50% snap share. Let me remind you that Kareem Hunt hasn't played in basically a year. The last time he played was November 14th of last season before he did some unspeakable things and got his, uh, himself kicked out of Kansas City. On top of that, he had sports hernia surgery during the season. So even if he was able to practice with the team uh, or if you thought he was able to, he wasn't for like four to six weeks. He had surgery during the season, which just doesn't help his chemistry with the team, doesn't help him you know, getting reps in. So 
I wouldn't expect him to have too big a role of a role. And if you really do think he is going to have big, as, as big of a role as like 50 to 60% of the snaps, um, first off, that's not going to happen. And second off, it's not like Nick Chubb is like an 80 to 90% snap share player this year. Um, these past two weeks, he's seen 63 and 60% of the snaps. Despite that, he's seen 21 and 24 touches. So even if he's not getting the, uh, the snap share that would indicate a workhorse or a bell cow, he really is because when he's on the field, he's being used, um, whether it's on the goal line or even in the passing game. He's on, tar- he's on pace for 50 receptions and 64 targets this year. So he really has the profile of a top five back, and he's pretty much returned that value all season despite being on a bad team. And if you think that, you know, because the Browns are terrible, he's not going to be able to produce, just look what he's done this year. Despite bad matchups, despite Baker Mayfield not knowing how to throw the football anymore, despite their offensive line not being great, He's been basically a top five running back. And with his schedule upcoming, uh, you look at who they play, right? Buffalo, Miami, Cincinnati, Arizona. Those are all great matchups. The only tough ones he has are against Pittsburgh twice uh, in the upcoming weeks. Over the next four weeks, he plays him twice. So that could be a little bit concerning. And you might think Baltimore is concerning, but the last time he played them, he went for 165 yards and three touchdowns. So um, he's kind of a matchup proof player just because he gives you that floor with his receiving game usage. And he's the only guy touching the ball in and around the end zone, uh, aside from like that Dontrell Hilliard and Vulture in week one. So if, if somebody's selling him for anything less than like a top five to top eight running back right now, uh, off the back of these past two weeks, and because I think Kareem Hunt is actually something right now, uh, I would be all in on buying him. Yeah, I think that's the biggest opportunity here is the whole Kareem Hunt thing. Because I mean, that's what scared people off in the beginning of the season. And we pretty much stuck to our guns. We said, by the time Kareem Hunt gets back, I think if you went back to our videos, I've probably said this exact phrase like nine times. But by the, team, by the time Kareem Hunt gets back, Nick Chubb is already going to have 1,000 yards from scrimmage and have, well, I, I probably said he was going to help them win a lot of games. But um, that, that second part has not been very true considering they're sitting at like two and six right now. But Chubb's been one of the most consistent fantasy running backs. And the, the thing with Kareem Hunt is, like, yes, he's going to have a role as they, you know, as we heard from reports today and yesterday. It's going to be a pass catching role. It's going to be the role that, like you said, he's not even playing, you know, 80 to 90% of the snaps. So it's like Dontra Hilliard is going to be the guy that takes a back seat. Chubb has been so good on the ground. And he's one of those guys that, you know, you want to see him get involved in the passing game. But listen, he's, what is he right now? Like a, a top five or top six fantasy running back? Yeah, he's probably around there. I think probably only behind like Cook, uh, McCaffrey. On a per, per game basis, maybe like Barkley. All right. Well, here the, the point I'm getting at is like he's that high and he has yet to go over 36 receiving yards in a single game and he has yet to score a receiving touchdown. That's not what's getting it done for him. He's getting it all done on the ground already and that's what he's going to continue to do because Kareem Hunt is not coming in and stealing 10 carries from him. If anything, he's going to steal five targets, maybe two carries, something like that. But Chubb has been so consistent on the ground because he's one of those guys – that yes, you think of him as like an early down grinder and guy that pounds through the line of scrimmage, but he also breaks off those huge runs. We saw it all last year. We saw it, you know, multiple times already this year. He is one of three running backs so far that has double digit fantasy points, half PPR in every single game. It's Nick Chubb, Dalvin Cook, Ezekiel Elliott. Those guys are consistent week in and week out. It's because they get the carries. Chubb has not been a guy. Yes, he's had a bunch of games where he goes for three receptions, four receptions, three receptions. But again, he has not had over 36 receiving yards in a single game. He's under 20 receiving yards in five out of the eight games that they've played so far and has not scored a receiving touchdown. So that has not been the reason why he's been such a good fantasy running back. He's still going to get the goal line work. He's still going to get 18 to 20 carries a game. He's gotten 20 carries, exactly 20 carries in four of the last five games. That should continue. Like you said, besides Pittsburgh, which is definitely a tough matchup, um, he has a lot of easy matchups on the ground. So Chubb, don't be scared off by the Kareem Hunt thing. Yes, Kareem Hunt is going to come in and get some work, but it's going to be from guys like Dontrell Hilliard. This offense runs through Nick Chubb when Baker Mayfield's obviously struggling, which has been the entirety of the season. And that's why Nick Chubb currently on pace for almost 1,900 yards from scrimmage and 12 touchdowns. So um, Chubb is a guy you absolutely need to buy because he's just so consistent. And I'm not worried whatsoever about Kareem Hunt coming back. What we do need to worry about is Case Keenum coming back. I think he is going to come back. I think this Washington Redskins franchise wants nothing to do with Dwayne Haskins right now. I think they, they understand that he has no place on an NFL field at this point. He needs to still mature and get better as a quarterback before they throw him into the gauntlet. And they've been forced to because Case Keenum is dealing with the concussion and whatever. I think he'll be back uh, after their buy, which is why I have Terry McLaurin as a buy low right now. 
He has been so good in every game that Dwayne Haskins is not the quarterback, right? He's had one bad game with Case Keenum, and that was in that, like, torrential downpour mud fest that they played against in San Francisco. The score was, like, 9 nothing that week. So that is uh, absolutely an outlier of a game. Um, if you look at the other games, 5 for 125 in a touchdown, 5 for 62 in a touchdown, 6 for 70 in a touchdown. His worst game was against New England Patriots when he was shadowed by Stephon Gilmore. I think that speaks – some volumes about who Terry McLaurin is when Bill Belichick has Stefan Gilmore shadow you like that tells you what he thinks of him. So in three for 51, like he had a, he had a bunch of tough contested catches that he pulled in. Then the next game four for 102 touchdowns. So right now, the way I look at it is uh, this is a great buy window for McLaurin because he's coming off of uh, the mud fest. He's coming off of back-to-back -back Dwayne Haskins games at Minnesota at Buffalo going four for 39 in both those. Those are really, really, really tough matchups. Now they have their buy in week 10. Um, so I want to obviously get this out to you guys now because a lot of people have their trade deadline coming up this week. Uh, so you might have to trade for him and then maybe sit him on your bench, obviously, because he's during the buy. But you want to get him before the deadline because if you look at the uh, schedule after the bye week in week 10, it's the Jets, it's the Lions, it's Carolina, it's Green Bay, Philadelphia, and New York. Now, Green Bay is um, – the tougher game on this schedule. But I mean, if you're going to tell me that he has five plus matchups out of six and Green Bay, I mean, they started off really, really elite in terms of their pass defense, but they haven't been necessarily shut down uh, over the last month or so. So they're not really a matchup that I'm like terrified to go up against, especially with this offense clicking barring, you know, last week was a bad game against the Chargers. But if the offensive click is clicking and they're putting up points, the other team's obviously going to have to score. And the Redskins are always playing from behind. Terry McLaurin is clear wide receiver one there. So if you're going to give me those matchups, Jets, Detroit, Carolina, I mean, just look at the playoff schedule too. Weeks 15 and week 16, like if you're a team that's going to get a bye in the first week of the playoffs, right, you play, uh, you're in a 12-team league, the top two seeds get a bye, you don't even have to worry about that Green Bay game. All you got to do is have that Philadelphia and New York Giants matchups on your schedule circled both at home. I think Terry McLaurin basically wins people their playoff matchups in those yeah. games. I think he's like a super easy guy to buy right now too because he's had a few down performances with Dwayne Haskins. And if people really think that coming off the buy, he's going to be the starter, sure, there's probably like a 5% chance of that happening. Yeah, that's the only thing. That's the only thing. If, if Dwayne Haskins remains the starter, you want nothing to do with anyone on this offense, no wide receivers or anything. I'm saying this out of expectations that I don't think the Redskins even want to start Haskins. They're being forced into throwing him there. Yeah, but even if, even if he does end up playing – that's a risk you can take because his price right now is so low that if Keenum does get the job, the return on the investment you're going to get from buying McLaurin right now with a buy coming off of terrible weeks is going to be huge because you even said it. Look at these matchups. They're just all green. They're all against terrible defenses. Even Green Bay, they haven't been good as you brought up before. Um, he just really has a road to the playoffs that you want out of a receiver that you can put in a flex on a weekly basis. And even if Haskins does play, It'll be like the first time all season he's had more than one week to like prepare as a starter. And I'm not going to say that's going to like turn everything around because he's looked terrible, but it'll at least be like a positive note for him because mm -hmm. so far he's played on like short weeks and he's played against tough defenses. So um, although he might not return value if Haskins stays behind center, it's a risk you should take if you're really trying to make that playoff push. Yeah, exactly. So McLaurin's a guy that I'm trying to buy just – yeah, I mean, like you said, too, also, like, Dwayne Haskins has looked terrible. But, I mean, at Buffalo, at Minnesota, like, what rookie quarterback is not going to struggle in those matchups? I, I don't think he's really uh, going to be a savior against the Jets or Detroit. But, I mean, this schedule is just ridiculously easy. Four out of the next six games are at home against, like, bottom – almost bottom five pass defenses. So, Terry McLaurin, go grab him. Yeah, and Philly just, like, cut one of their starting safeties, Sandejo or whatever. So, I don't know what's going on there. And that's week 15, I think it was. So, that's going to be beautiful. And now this part of the video is more so looking at strictly playoff and regular season schedules, not so much like in-depth analysis about the player themself, um, themselves. And we're going to start off with Derrick Henry of the Tennessee Titans as somebody to sell high and avoid for the rest of the season. And I know a lot of you guys aren't like huge into us talking shit about Derrick Henry because he somehow is like one of your favorite players and animal brainwashed you. But um, <laughs> if you want to just look at who he faces from here on out, other than next week against Kansas City, who is admittedly awful against the run, they get Jacksonville, Indianapolis, Oakland, Houston, New Orleans. And just looking at the chart that's provided, basically weeks 13 through 16 are just terrible matchups. And along with that, they have a buy in week 11. So that's one week where you're going to have to play somebody who, if you own him or if you're thinking about trading for Derrick Henry, um, that's going to be a week where you're not going to have value from him and you're going to have to rely on a backup running back. 
And just other than that, right, these aren't game scripts that you're going to expect them to produce too well because, one, these defenses are funnel defenses, right? Oakland, Houston, New Orleans are all very good against the run and aren't very good against the pass. And we're going to talk about Corey Davis later, but that bodes well more so for the passing game, which is something that Derrick Henry isn't involved in uh, in a consistent basis. So if you have the chance to sell him now coming off of some pretty decent weeks in a game against Kansas City this week, if somebody is like, what, three and six, four and five, and they want wins now and they see that game upcoming, um, ship him off because I think down the stretch you can't really rely on a guy who's touchdown dependent facing defenses that aren't going to let him into the end zone all too easily. Yeah, I'm with you there, man. That end of season schedule is brutal. So again, if your trade deadline is after this weekend, it's next week, let him play against Kansas City, let him rack up a bunch of yards. I'm not even really that confident that he's going to have that big of a game against Kansas City because Mahomes is going to be back. Well, I, I expect Mahomes to be back because he's been pretty close to playing the last couple of weeks, uh, which obviously puts a shootout potential in the range of outcomes there. And if they're in a shootout, like Derrick Henry becomes pretty much you know useless because I know he had three catches last week, but if you look at his reception totals and his target totals, like the six weeks prior to that, one catch, one catch, one catch, zero catches, one catch, one catch, two catch, one catch. So that was the first time all year that he's had. The second time all year that he's had multiple catches. First time he's had over two catches. So uh, that was an absolute like outlier of a performance and it wasn't even that good. It was just three for 36. He's also like, I mean, obviously they're using him a lot compared to other running backs, but of the last four games, he's had 16 or fewer carries in three of those four games. I just, I don't know. There's there's a lot to go wrong here with Henry. Like when you have a player that's very stylistic the way he is and, and that he needs certain game scripts in order to succeed. Like, yeah, you're, you know, you're excited about the floor that he gives you, but a ton of times he's like, he's not giving you any ceiling there. There are uh, big games, like the big game he just had. And then there was a game in week one where he had a big game. But besides that, like the other games have been pretty mediocre and it's, you know, there is something to say for consistency, but if Derrick Henry can go back to back weeks giving off like monster games, then you're going to want to flip him because he will come back to that, you know, 12 points, 10 points if he doesn't get in the end zone kind of thing. So I'm ready to flip uh, Derrick Henry. Now, a couple Wait, of I just want to bring up one thing real quick. You said his two big games were last week and week one. Do you know what was similar between those two games? Um, let me look at the matchups right quick. At Cleveland, at Carolina. Um, no. He it's caught been, a touchdown. Yeah. That's the only thing. And you can't expect a guy who sees, like, over the past six weeks, he's seen more than one target twice. He's not getting used in the passing game. And if you remember back to week one, it was that 75-yard screen where he ran in a straight line the entire way for a big touchdown. So if he's not giving you this, like, receiving upside or receiving consistency on a weekly basis, you're looking at, like, back in RB2 numbers. Another thing that's concerning is four of his six rushing touchdowns this year came from the one-yard line. And I know we brought it up before, but, like, three of those, and maybe even four of those, because one of them happened recently and I didn't look into it, but three of those I know for sure were off the back of penalties. So if they're not just getting these like lucky PI calls in the end zone for him to just plunge in for six, uh, those touchdowns aren't there for him. And another thing is he has four touches or four rushes on inside the five this year. Every single one has gone for a touchdown. So maybe he's just great inside the five, but also maybe there's some regression there that maybe every time he doesn't touch the ball in that area, he finds six. Yeah. In points per game, like fantasy points per game, he's the RB 13 right now. So on a week over week basis, he's not actually even an RB one in 12 team leagues. Obviously, he gives you consistency, which there is something to be said for that. But you could definitely sell him for an RB1 price. And if that's something you could do, like if you could flip him for like a, an Alvin Kamara after this week, I mean, Kamara will probably have a big game. But like any of those guys that are ahead of him, ranked ahead of him, I would take over Derrick Henry uh, rest of season. And, you know, Dalvin Cook has been far, far ahead of him. And I'll, I just want to touch on his playoff schedule. Uh, his playoff schedule is ridiculous. Week 14, home against Detroit. Week 15, at the Chargers. Week 16, Green Bay. Those are all teams that you could absolutely exploit on the ground. So this is more just like congratulations if you have Dalvin Cook because you probably are going to win your league. It's going to be interesting to see. Um, you know, we're getting in that territory where there are guys like Damian Williams, who was like a league winner last year, but he didn't do shit up until probably like week 12 or week 13. And there will be guys this year who kind of explode out of nowhere and, you know, and help you win your week. So you could look at the obvious ones like a Dalvin Cook who has this crazy, crazy good matchup. Um, but then there's a guy like David Montgomery. Uh, where week 14 he's playing Dallas, week 15 he's at Green Bay, week 16 he's Kansas City. So those two games, 15, 15 and 16, are really, 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 really good run funnel games for a guy like David Montgomery who's seeing a ridiculous amount of work right now. I don't know how much you necessarily trust the Chicago offense, 
Um, and Dallas is, has definitely been better um, against the run on the ground as of late. You saw them kind of swallow up Saquon Barkley. But if I'm looking at the playoffs, I'm, I'm probably concerned about week 15 and week 16, especially, obviously, if you have a bye in week 14. But I think Montgomery has a really good playoff schedule. Dalvin Cook has a really good playoff schedule. So these are guys to just start kind of thinking ahead of or uh, thinking ahead for if you're going to start flipping uh, running backs. Like maybe even Derek uh, – actually, I don't think any Dalvin Cook owner is going to end up selling Dalvin Cook. But, like, um, I'm not sure what Christian McCaffrey's playoff schedule looks like, but it might be something worth worth looking into. If McCaffrey has a tough playoff schedule, maybe like a Cook for – uh, McCaffrey flip because right now I mean like McCaffrey is single-handedly winning you leagues but if he has three really 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 tough matchups to finish the year while Cook has a really 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 good schedule maybe that's something to consider I don't know McCaffrey from here on out gets Green Bay this week which is beautiful Falcons Saints is tough but I mean he catches passes and Saints aren't yeah. great against the best Redskins and Falcons so yeah. he has never mind yeah he has a pretty plush match I'll just shut my mouth yeah <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't hate though maybe trading McCaffrey for Dalvin Cook and a piece because McCaffrey is seen as like this otherworldly tier, which yeah. he is. But if you can get like Dalvin Cook and maybe you're thin at receiver and you want a guy like maybe DJ Chark is a little bit too low, but you can pair those two guys. What you got to do is you got to look at one, the difference between Dalvin Cook and McCaffrey on a per game basis. And two, the difference between the second player in the deal and who you're going to replace them with and see if that offsets in the trade. And I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do that just because Dalvin Cook is Dalvin Cook and the owner probably isn't going to send him in a package deal for anybody. Um, but if you could pull that off, I wouldn't be opposed to moving McCaffrey for that type of deal. Yeah, it'd be an interesting swap. Um, let, us, let us know if, if you've been able to trade for Dalvin Cook or Christian McCaffrey, uh, I would say like semi-recently, maybe within the last month, I'm interested to hear what you had to give in order to get them. Because I get some ridiculous tweets at me saying like what they had to give up that like wasn't that much. I'm like, like who the fuck owns these guys that would give them up for anything less than, you know, an RB one plus a wide receiver one. Yeah. I actually just recently got a DM. It was about Alvin Kamara. He's like, should I give him up for David Montgomery Brissett? And he was like Mohamed Sanu. And I'm like, what is, what is going on? Like <laughs> not even close. Um, the next guy we're going to touch on who has a pretty horrific uh, schedule from here on out other than this week is Marlon Mack of the Indianapolis Colts. This week, he does get Miami, who is terrible against the run. In week 16, he gets Carolina, who is not good against the run. But in between that, when you're trying to rack up wins, go into the playoffs with a head of steam, Jacksonville, Houston, Tennessee, Tampa Bay, New Orleans. And again, three of those matchups, Houston, Tampa Bay, New Orleans, those are pass funnel teams. Brissett will probably be back by those weeks. It seems like he might even play this week. So it's not like their passing game is going to be completely hampered. And if it is, like, what are the chances he gets those goal line looks? And that's you know, that's the reason we were so high on Marlon Mack this year was because if Andrew Luck was playing and with just how much they were running towards the end of the season last year, Marlon Mack was going to see easy 14, 15 touchdowns. This year, he's only rushed three uh, for three touchdowns, and he only has three carries inside the five-yard line. So the volume isn't there. He hasn't really been that upside player that we were hoping to see. Um, I think he's on pace for either 20 or 25 targets on the year. So it's not looking great for him. And just with this schedule upcoming, um, I mean, if you look at Tennessee, they don't look too bad, but that's also because Christian McCaffrey just gashed them for, I think, three touchdowns and like almost 200 yards from scrimmage last year so or last week. So that's not really um, truly indicative of how good they are against the run. I'd more so look at the run defense grade being number two. Um, so basically weeks 11 through 15, he's got a terrible schedule. He's not being involved in the passing game, and he's not really scoring a bunch of touchdowns. So if he doesn't break off a long run in any of these weeks, he's not winning you a week, and he's not going to really help you um, make the playoffs or – well, he might help you make the playoffs, but he's not going to help you make the championship, uh, which is the only matchup from here on out where you're going to be looking forward to starting him. Yeah, I'm definitely fine moving, Mac. I mean, you talk about him not having a ceiling. He has no ceiling. Like, he's done almost nothing since that week one game where he went for almost, you know, 24 points or whatever. But, like, since then, 7, 15.8, 3.9. Like, it, it's a mix of, like, 6 points and 14 points. So, we're talking about no ceiling. The floor is there only when he finds the end zone. And – you want to talk about like Derrick Henry not catching passes. Marlon Mack has three individual games with zero catches. Um, he has not had a game over 16 receiving yards in that game. And yeah, like you said, I mean, he's on pace for 22 catches on the year, and that's horrible. I mean, it's great when you're getting 21 carries, but when you turn it into 89 yards, 89 scoreless yards, and you don't catch a pass, like you're going to tell me you're going to get 21 touches and end up with eight fantasy points. Like that is, that's terrible. And that's in his range of outcomes week over week. And if the schedule is not good, um, you know, I, I, Marlon Mack is definitely a guy I'd be looking to sell after Miami. If you have the uh, luxury of waiting on the trade trade deadline, 
Um, but if not, then I would try to move him now. Let your fucking opponent be happy that he got a good Miami game out of him. But you know, in the long run, it's not a it's not a good thing to keep him around. Speaking of Miami, and I touched on this guy during my waiver wire video this morning. Um, Devontae Parker, man, with Preston Williams out for the year, Ryan Fitzpatrick is looking at Parker. He scored a touchdown in four of the last five games in his playoff schedule. New York Jets, New York Giants, Cincinnati. And a week before that, he's got Philadelphia in week 13. So it's four good matchups in a row. I know Cincinnati, if you look on the chart, a little bit yellow there in terms of fantasy points allowed. But that's only because teams have been able to absolutely just thrash his defense and all they have to do is pound the rock and run the ball because they're horrible against running backs. Um, but Miami's not a team that's going to put Cincinnati away in the first half, so they're going to have to continue to throw the ball. So those are three really, really – four really, really good matchups in a row. Um, and like you said, tougher um, – oh, no, we're talking about Miami, not Tennessee. But regardless, it's good for a guy like Devontae Parker. Even a guy like Mike Kosicki gets a little bit interesting with Preston Williams out there. Um, so Devontae Parker is someone that you probably need to grab on your – waiver wire if he is available for not only just like a, a fill-in during the bye weeks, but his playoff schedule is so, so good. Yeah, he's getting so much volume, and that's only going to increase because they really have no weapons now other, other than like Albert Wilson and himself, and they have like Kalen Balaj in the backfield. So although you brought up that Cincinnati's terrible against the run, he's not going to do anything against Cincinnati on the ground. Um, Cincinnati's secondary isn't even that good, so he's going to be able to expose them. He's like a freak athlete that hasn't shown. He's a freak athlete since like 2013. He's a freak um, athlete, but he's just not a good football player. That's the problem. Yeah, it's the issue. I think Max has that same issue. I'm sorry, Animal. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, his playoff schedule and just – even though, like, these past few weeks haven't – he hasn't had as good of matchups as he's going to have weeks 14 through 16, he's produced. So, yeah. I don't – like, even right now, I think he's a solid flex play in an offense that's just going to throw the ball a ton with a quarterback that doesn't care if you're triple covered, he's going to force it into you. Yeah, that's the thing about Parker. Being the athlete that he is, that's like the kind of guys that Fitzpatrick likes to chuck it up to. Like going back to last year, you look in Tampa Bay, which like the Mike Evans types, right? And he just chucks it up. Parker's that athletic guy, so tall. Um, he can get up there during contested catches. So in the end zone, you know he's looking at Parker. On the deep balls, you know he's looking at Parker. And those are the valuable passes. So it's going to be super inefficient in the pass game for Miami, but it still comes with a, uh, with a ton of volume. And on the flip side of, you know, Marlon Mack, those defenses being really tough against the run, T.Y. Hilton's playoff schedule is really, really good. So T.Y. Hilton's a guy that I'd be looking to trade for if I am in a really good spot right now. Like if I know I'm going to make the playoffs, maybe I'm one loss, maybe I'm two losses, but I have a ton of points scored and I'm definitely um, going to be fine and have a little bit of cushion to work with because T.Y. Hilton's obviously out for another two weeks, maybe three weeks. His week 14, 15, 16 is – it's all NFC South teams. Uh, I'm not sure how the schedule ended up like this, but it's Tampa Bay, New Orleans, Carolina. Um, those are all teams that allow a lot of fantasy points to the wide receiver. So uh, T.Y. Hilton is a guy that I think will come back, come back strong. He'll go under the radar for a while because he's been hurt and he's been banged up a little bit. And this Colts team, like, I don't know if they really have an identity right now with Jacoby Brissett as their quarterback. But I think once he's back, I mean, he was operating as a true number one. And he was doing really well fantasy-wise uh, prior to the injury. So Hilton's a guy that I think you could stash in. If you have the luxury of, you know, holding on to him, uh, the schedule gets really, really, really easy for the wide receivers. Yeah, and I don't think you have to worry about him being shut down unless this injury is super serious. Like, they're not going to shut him down because they're out of the playoff hunt. They're 5-3 and three right now. They're just one game back of the Texans. And you look at who they play upcoming. Dolphins, that's a win. Jacksonville, that's probably close, but probably a win. Texans going to be tough. Titans, probably a win. Buccaneers, probably a win. So by the time he's back for these playoff matchups, 14, 15, 16, he's probably going to be a, at least healthier than he is right now, and he's probably not going to be held out um, if he's good to go. And these matchups are, as you said, just perfect for him because their funnel defense is towards the pass, and he's going to be getting volume as a true alpha number one. And you remember a few weeks back where um, he was, I think, limited heading into the week because of a hamstring or quad injury. He played one half and he had like 15 half PPR fantasy points because he scored right away. That's just the player he is. Yeah, he's a savage. And uh, on the flip side of Derrick Henry, we have these Tennessee Titans wide receivers. Now, this is not people that you're trading for because most of them are probably widely available in your leagues. But their playoff schedules, while, again, these defenses are tough against the run, very, 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 very wide receiver friendly when it comes to fantasy, right? Oakland in week 14, Houston week 15, New Orleans week 16. So – uh, I, I like the chemistry we're seeing with Tannehill and A.J. Brown. I know uh, last week he – well, this previous Sunday he caught, I don't know, uh, four or five balls maybe for like 80-something yards, I think. 
The week before that, he didn't get a lot of targets, but he scored a touchdown. And the week before that, he had a big game with Ryan Tannehill. So I think we're seeing a little bit of the chemistry kind of uh, creep up a little bit. And we're seeing the Tannehill, A.J. Brown connection. I think it'll only get stronger as the weeks go by. And by the time they hit week 14, week 15, week 16, it's wheels up because the run game ain't going to work there. And Tannehill's going to have to throw the ball. We've seen him go for over 300 passing yards in two of the last three games already. So he's showing a ceiling in the passing game that we did not see with Mariota in basically any time that he was there as their quarterback. So um, I like both of these wide receivers here in Tennessee as guys that, you know, you could fill in for maybe an injured player or if you're in a deep league and they're available on the uh, waiver wire, you could do that. And sticking within the same division, DJ Chark, right? We talked about Jacksonville and their playoff schedule, but uh, the passing the passing game sees uh, a really, really, really nice schedule from weeks 13 to week 16. They have the Chargers in the middle of that, which is uh, a little bit difficult, but they've been kind of spotty when it comes to their defense. They have Tampa Bay week 13, Chargers week 14, then they get Oakland and Atlanta week 15 and 16. So I don't know if you can get a juicier playoff, like a duo matchup between those two teams to end the year. DJ chart has been inconsistent. We don't exactly know what the chemistry is going to be like between him and Nick Foles. Well, he did see a 25% target share with him on eight targets. He saw two of them. On eight, wow, really, <laughs> really good uh, sample. It's a huge sample. It makes me very confident. No, but on the real, um, I just think DJ Chark is a very good player. I know he's been inconsistent because he's that he, he's almost developing into like a more of a deep threat guy, and um, those guys don't tend to see a ton of consistency over the long run. But I, I still think like in matchups like Oakland or Atlanta, uh, he could be a great flex play that gives you you know championship winning upside because when you're in the championship game, you're obviously playing against another very good team and you need to score a lot of points to win those games. So DJ Chark is a guy that doesn't really provide you with a floor, but you need upside in those weeks. If you want to, you want to bring home the hardware. Yeah. And they're only like pseudo tough matchup is the chargers. But if there's one thing that their secondary struggles against or two things, it's fast players and like big physical players. We saw Cortland Sutton tear them up every single year. Tyree kill kills them. And I'm not comparing his skill set to either one of those guys, but if there's somebody that's going to do it, it's him. And if you look at who they've played recently, the reason why their fantasy points are so low, since week three, they've played the Dolphins, the Broncos, the Steelers, when uh, Duck, what's his name, Duck Hodges was yeah. starting, um, the Titans, the Bears, and then Pat, the Packers with Devontae Adams coming back for his first game. So they haven't really faced many good receivers that you'd expect to put up a ton of points against them. That's why it's a bit low. Their secondary isn't great. Uh, Derwin James may return, but I'm not really sure how much a hobble Derwin James is going to affect uh, their secondary. Let me ask you something. You touched on Devontae Adams real quick. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about this Packers offense with Devonte Adams back. I know that sounds dumb to say, but it almost seems like the Melvin Gordon effect where it's like you get this guy back and you know he's ultra talented, but like, do you, are you altering the offense too much to try to force him the ball because you know he should touch the ball rather than just like letting it run naturally? Because somehow this offense got into such a groove while they had like fucking B-level players as their wide receivers and they were cruising and the Packers were looking great. They get Devontae Adams back, he leads the team in targets, but they literally get nothing going on offense. And we saw that with Melvin Gordon for, you know, a bunch of weeks up until they played against the Packers. Like, I'm, I'm very happy to have Adams back if I'm an Adams owner, but I, I don't know. It kind of makes me nervous for, uh, for a guy that owns a lot of Aaron Jones. Yeah. What do you have, like seven catches for 40 yards? I think Adams That's like did. 11 tar- – I think he went maybe – yeah, like eight for 45 or eight. I don't know, something in that range. We had 11 targets, and it's like the Green Bay Packers offense looked fucking terrible. Maybe they thought it was going to be like a sleepwalk game because the Chargers have been terrible defensively. Maybe they thought that like Adams wouldn't have to go all out and practice this week and they could just like roll him out there and fully implement him into the offense. I don't know. Like, they just look terrible. Like Aaron Jones couldn't get anything going on the ground, and against the Chargers, that's like a pretty bad thing because they, they can't stop terrible anybody. in the beginning of the year when they had Adams too, and it just seemed like they were forcing balls to to players, and like the offense was not going well. And then all of a sudden they started playing well, and we're like, oh, it just took a few weeks for them to get Matt Lafleur's offense going, and now it just looks like it took a, a huge step back. So it's just like, fuck, you know? Yeah. And the last thing we're gonna bring up, this is kind of um, what we're planning on doing for the rest of the season. Um, or at least next week are guys that you can stream people off waiver wires that oh, well, uh, let's, let's let's keep this as a sneak let's not even show them this we'll but show, we'll yeah, see, you know we'll what, we're, gonna, we're gonna end it there we got a good right. a double duo of two quarterbacks who if you pair them together who are both almost definitely available on your waiver wires you are getting all the Miamis the Houston's the Tampa Bay's the Oakland's and the Atlanta matchups like that is all of the matchups for the remainder of the year guys that you could stream that are probably available and 
80 to 90 percent of leagues that's going to be our upcoming content for the wednesday videos going forward is like the best streaming pairing options whether it's defense tight ends or or quarterbacks so we're going to leave you with uh, a little bit of blue balls there um, but i hope you all got enough information from the video itself if you did make sure you are following us on the socials twitter all the uh, instagrams and, and that kind of shit link down below Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video and make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new to the channel. That is all. We'll see y'all on uh, next Wednesday's streaming.